Hi, thanks for coming today. Uh, I'd love to see you if you anyone would like to turn on their their video camera. It'd be nice to to do this together if you feel like it. Um, there are so many things that we could have talked about today. So um, I had to make a choice and and I decided to to talk about some things that for me are uh, are are particularly important and and one of the main things is um uh, is the communication communication between especially above all between musicians and their engineer um over the years i've noticed what an innate lack of trust there often is between between musicians and engineers whether it be in the studio or in a live situation. Some of it is probably justified as there are unfortunately many improvised engineers around, often the ones that bought the sound system or put together a home studio as a passion, think their investment automatically makes them qualified. But aside from that category, I believe one of the main reasons is the lack of awareness on the part of each group of the needs and problems of the other. And the presumption that my job is more important than your job and without me, your job is meaningless, without taking into account that without me, your job is meaningless is absolutely true, but on both sides of the fence when it comes to live sound and recording. So I'd like to suggest another way of dealing with each other um, after having taught this course um, and analyzed the various issues, I've come to realize that some points are useful not only to communicate with your engineer, but also um, to communicate with your with your neighbor, with your grocer, and and uh, to to be happier and uh, and help others be happier. So um, I'm pleased to to teach this course and. I want to let you know also that what I'll be saying to you as musicians are many of them are the same things I say to my recording students. So um, don't think um, it's just a, it's a one way street. Um, so the first point I I would like to make is that your engineer is your friend and not your enemy. OK, the importance of working together. Maybe the most important thing to learn when you work as a professional is uh, understanding that you're not alone. Everything that gets accomplished is a result of working in a group. A hierarchy almost always, always exists, but cooperation between individuals is essential. Uh, once you've figured out that it's to your own advantage to get along and collaborate and not constantly challenge or provoke, you're already a step ahead. We should all have the same objective, and that is the best musical result. That has to, I think we all have to keep that in mind constantly. We're all working toward the same goal. The first step to take is to learn your engineer's name. It seems silly, but calling someone by name is incredibly important for starting a positive relationship. Uh, I don't like sitting in the control room or behind the console and say, drummer, or play the bass drum. I much prefer calling them by name and, and installing um, a relationship from the beginning. Many use the excuse that they can't remember names, but usually that's because in the moment someone is introducing themselves, you're looking at your shoes or their shoes or their hair or thinking about what you have, want to have for lunch. Um, or what you're going to say back. So those five seconds of distraction are, are your downfall. Um, a little trick I was taught years ago goes like this. I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Marty. I stick out my hand. And I look the other person in the eye. And when they present themselves, I say their name back. I something like, hi, Jim. And the fact of saying their name out loud helps me to remember it. And then maybe I turn around and write it down <laughs> because <laughs> I can't remember. I can't remember everything either. Um, but uh, that if I hang on to that 
concentration in the first moment and don't get distracted. It really is a question of five seconds. Um, it will help me remember their name and it will be the beginning of um, um, a, um, a relationship, a work relationship that is will be more positive from the beginning. It's like saying, I recognize you. I, um, as a, as an, as a, as a person, not a, just as a musician, just somebody that's sitting or someone that's sitting behind the console. Um, so calling someone by name is an, is an important way to put yourself on the same team. The second point is to understand the difference between roles of a, for example, a front of house engineer and that of a monitor engineer. If you're in a live gig and you need something different in your monitor, don't ask the front of house engineer. In you need to ask the monitor engineer. And this sounds silly, but, um, and maybe that seems obvious and it seems obvious to me, but it's evidently not obvious to everyone. So, um, and another thing is don't, um, don't just sit there and grumble. If you need something, ask for it. If you're in the studio and you need to change headphones or a cable because it's broken, tell the assistant. Don't just grumble with your fellow musicians. In either case, if you have to take out the jack from your amp or from your keyboard, tell us and give us the time to close the mic channel so you or somebody else doesn't get blasted in your headphones or us on the speakers. That's that's an important point. There's a... There's a lot, oftentimes, a lot of electric current that goes through cables. And if you unhook them um, brusquely, it will just give you a really loud shock. And if somebody has headphones on, it's it can be pretty dangerous. The third point is, I'll say it from my point of view, is understanding the needs of the engineer. As in all relationships, we should try to learn the needs of those we're dealing with. In our case, I can tell you from the engineer's point of view, but it's important also for us to know yours. If you want to get off on the wrong foot with me, just say, I can't hear myself after you've come up to the mic and played your first note. Um, you have to know that for you to hear yourself, I have to hear you first, get a level, and a sound and send it back to you. And it's not instantaneous. Uh, the musicians that the musician that's on the engineer's side knows that perfectly well and will play in front of the microphone, even by themselves, until the engineer has had a chance to get a decent sound to be able to send back to the headphones or monitors. Then the engineer should ask. If you hear what you need, which is the moment for you to express your needs if they haven't already been met? Whenever possible, and I'd like to emphasize this, please take the necessary time to get your headphones or your monitors right. Um, there's, it doesn't always seem like there's the time, but it's surprising how important it is to take those extra minutes to get it right. It means that you will play better. And if you play better, my job is actually easier. Um, to hear a musician say after the show or recording that their headphone or monitor mix was horrible makes me very upset and, and to be honest, a little annoyed. I always wonder why the person didn't ask for what they needed to hear themselves better, to be able to play better instead of suffering the whole time it would have been useful for everybody. Sometimes it's frustrating and I, I understand that because you don't always have someone on the other side who is, um, is um, comes to your aid as you'd like to. But um, I honestly think it's, it's better to insist. I think uh, you should wait until your headphone mix or your monitor mix is good before going ahead. You can tell them I said that. <laughs> How to get a good headphone mix. What to ask for. Let's see. Well, singers and horn players, you need something harmonic in your, in your headphones or in your monitors for intonation. 
bass or piano, not a keyboard with a lot of chorus on it, uh, and sufficient rhythm, rhythm to play in time. Not so much of yourself that you lose these reference points. So you don't want yourself really loud because you will lose your sense of you can lose your sense of what the timing is of the of the track of your of the other musicians and another important thing you can lose the sense of dynamics um, because you can play really soft and hear yourself anyway when maybe other everybody else is playing medium loud so if if you have a a track that's going on underneath you with its dynamics and you just float on top of that then you can be able to you'll be able to play with the correct dynamics uh, of the rest of the band. Consider the possibility of taking off one side of your headphones to hear yourself acoustically in the room, which is especially useful for intonation. I always suggest that um, singers, horn players, string players. Reverb is good, but too much can make intonation difficult. Another important thing is having the right overall volume that makes you want to play along. Uh, it's like singing along with the radio. If it's too soft, you're not inspired. And if it's too loud, you have to yell. So um, imagine sitting on the couch with your headphones on and listening to an album that you like. And, and you have that right sort of volume where you're really inspired to sit there and listen. And you can imagine how important that is if you're gonna be playing on top of it. For drummers, uh, you need enough click in the phones. If you have your own little mixer you bring with you or one that's provided um, by the, um, the studio or, uh, or live, you can adjust it yourself. You'll need to hear the bass to be able to play together. And again, some harmonic instruments to get your dynamics right with the rest of the band. And a little voice or melodic instrument to be in the structure of the song. Live, you might want a subwoofer behind your back or under your stool. Um, it can get a little dangerous if you want it too loud because it all that low end will go into the microphones, but it can be help, a help if you feel like you're missing the bass, which may not come across on headphones or monitors. So having that, having that subwoofer that moves you a little bit can, um, can be a help to you. For the bass, a little extra bass drum. Uh, again, a bit of voice or a lead instrument for the structure and harmonic instruments for dynamics. It's kind of the same rule for everybody. You may want a bit more of yourself in the phones. You consider you can consider raising the bass amp uh, a little closer to ear level uh, so you can feel it a little bit more. I understand the difficulty uh, playing, especially if there's just a, just a DI, just a cable and that's all you're hearing in the phones and you don't have any of that pressure, physical pressure that you're used to hearing from your amplifier. So um, if you wanna move that a uh, little bit nearer to you, I think that could be a, a, a help. For a, a guitar players in the best conditions, a little of everything with a bit more of yourself. When the, I'm oftentimes with electric guitar players, um, I end up giving them a lot more of themselves in the phones because they're used to being in front of the amplifier and hearing themselves a lot. So um, if you need more of yourself, if you need a lot more of yourself, go ahead and ask for it, but make sure you don't lose the timing and the dynamics of everybody else. And this goes for piano and keyboards. Working live, unfortunately, with monitors on stage, you can't hope to have a record mix. Um, have the monitor engineer put in what you need as a reference, both harmonic and rhythmic, not much, not too much reverb, but enough so you're stimulated to play without losing the tuning center. And keep your monitor as, as minimal 
if you have a monitor on stage, don't turn it up too loud uh, because it will just make a mess of the sound in general and not just for who's uh, out in the audience or the front of house engineer, but also there will be more confusion on stage. So try to encourage each other to keep the monitor levels down. So let's talk a little about um, terminology to communicate better with the engineer. Um, we can talk about highs or brightness or top end. There can be linguistic mix-ups depending on your language. In Italian, for example, someone may use the term secchi to mean high frequencies, but to me secco, which means dry, uh, means a sound without reverb. So you may have those kinds of misunderstandings in your own language and, and, and try to find out, find out what the best terms are to communicate um, certain frequency problems that you, that you need. Maybe you need your headphones a little bit brighter or uh, your own instrument with a little more um, air on it and brightness and or presence or whatever it is. So um, if you can find the right terms to, uh, to be able to communicate that. Um, the biggest area of misunderstanding is the mid-range because the mid-range goes from about 200 Hertz, which is if you have, if you know what a, a cello sounds like when it goes down into the low range and all of a sudden it goes woo, and or an acoustic guitar when it's down in the low on the low chords and, and it will do the same woo when it goes through there. Um, that's about 200 hertz to give you an idea. And the mid range goes from there, what's considered mid range, up to around 6,000 hertz. And that's, you know what the sliding on the chords of an acoustic guitar sound like when it goes, yee, that screech, that's where that is. So you can imagine if, if somebody's complaining or needs an adjustment in the mid range, we need to be a little more specific about that. So are we talking about the high mid range, which is what we were, what I was just talking about, the guitar screech, or the low mid range? or the mid mid range be try to be specific especially here the low mids are where the warmth is but also where confusion arises the sound may be boomy especially critical are the frequencies between 200 and 350 where so many instrument li instruments lie including the voice almost everything plays in that area um, all the guitars, the keyboards, the piano, the voice, uh, the saxophones, trombones, everything is has a part of their sound in that area. So you can imagine that it gets can get pretty messy there. Um, if it seems like a sound is coming over the telephone or a megaphone, those are the that's the mid mid range between 800 and 1200 hertz. If a sound pokes you and hurts your ears, or you need more presence or definition, those are the high mids from about 2000 to 6000 hertz. I'm talking a little more, it's a little more technical for you, but I thought I'd throw in some numbers there. It can help you um, if you have to do your own sound live, or if you have a home studio and, and you need to deal with some of those problems it's good it's good to know those numbers it gives you a starting point so you just don't it's just not a guessing game the whole time bass frequencies give warmth and depth but can also cause what we call muddiness and confusion in the in that area um, they can also on live that can be a problem creating feedback on the on the stage with those low frequencies going into the subwoofers and going back into the microphones we know what feedback is that's what feedback is is when 
a microphone picks up a sound and it gets sent out through the speakers and then it gets picked up again by the microphone and sent out through the speakers and that's a really fast that's why it kind of goes in a crescendo when a when um when feedback starts it's not just be it's usually isn't immediate it's more immediate when the fr frequencies are higher for example of a singer in front of their monitors and that's because the freq high frequencies are faster and so that loop happens faster whereas the low frequencies take a little bit longer and you just hear it grow and that's what's happening it's um the sound is coming out of the speakers into the microphone out of the speakers into the microphone and it just is makes this huge crescendo so you have to be a little careful about too much down there in the in the low end do you want more high end or less bass it's not the same thing and sometimes it can feel like it's the same thing sometimes we think something is dark sounding and we need to figure out if there's too much bass or if it's not bright enough so you have to have to sort of analyze and decide well do i need more definition or is it or is it just too muddy down there and i have too much bass another term these days which gets very confusing very very confused is dynamics dynamics doesn't mean loud it means dynamics it means it's loud and it's soft and it's medium and it's really loud and it's really soft that is what a song that's very dynamic is it's not a song that's loud from the beginning to the end so i think in the the loudness wars of the last few years that's uh that's kind of gotten a little bit confused as a term it's better to call reverb reverb and not echo as it can be confused with delay so that's a difference and it's good to learn to describe what you need without putting your hands on the console because depending on who's behind the console you could lose a finger if you're not careful the next um, category i'd like to talk about the next subject is to know your own instrument where does the sound come out especially if you play an unusual instrument here with medinea we're coming across all kinds of instruments from all over the world, um, uh, often string instruments and wind instruments. Um, and maybe you find either if you're playing an unusual instrument or maybe you find yourself with an engineer with not a lot of experience, it's good to be able to tell them where the best sound comes out. And in your experience, where the best place might be to put the microphone. When I find myself with, uh, with an instrument that I've never seen before, I always ask the musician um, where, where the best place is to put the microphone. The first time I saw a bassoon, this huge, this double tubes, this huge long thing. I said, where am I going to put the microphone here? And um oftentimes a musician with some experience will be able to maybe they don't even know themselves but if they've had experience in the studio or working live they know where the microphones have been put in the past and what has worked better so um you can help us out that way And it's important to realize also that there's a difference in sound between when you're playing or when you're in front of the instrument listening. If you play the cello, for example, an instrument that vibrates considerably and while you're hugging it as you play it makes you vibrate as well. So the sound from the microphone will never be that which you hear while you're playing. Here it's important to know what sound you're looking for, but because you've heard it as a spectator and not as a player. If you want to, you can bring an example of something recorded that you like 
And, and that can be a good clue for us what kind of a sound that you're looking for. You need also to be aware of your own sound quality. If you're a saxophonist and want a Stan Getz type of sound, you have to have that sound to begin with. If you sound like Stanley Turrentine, if anyone knows who that is, um, I'll never make it to Stan Getz. A musician who doesn't practice or in particular doesn't work on his or her sound can't expect to have a fantastic sound, nor that an engineer can bring it out. So be honest and don't ask for the impossible. Um, I've had that happen to me. I've had a uh, uh, worked with a, a jazz drummer and the client wanted the drums to sound like this a rock drummer. And I said, well, you, I think you called the wrong guy. I mean, I can only get, I can only get you so close. So um, it's, it's important to know what you're starting with, to know where you can end up. How to use the microphone to get the sound you're looking for, for those uh, to whom it's relevant. Experiment with mic position. Move in front of the microphone and note through what you hear in the headphones or the monitors how the sound changes. And once you've found the position which gives you the best sound, memorize it. Look what your distance is and find a, find a reference point and try to stay put as much as possible. Then using movement though to change timbre. Further away will give you a thinner sound, closer up a warmer sound, for example. If you like a microphone you've been given, um, write down what it is and ask for it or suggest it the next time. Remembering what works for you and your instrument will help you in the future. Singers, learn to use the microphone, moving away when you sing louder, getting closer for a more intimate sound. Avoid the temptation to lean in when you're yelling, which is kind of physiological, you know, ah, like you're yelling at somebody. Um, and it doesn't mean moving away a half a meter. It can just be a question of leaning on your back foot or leaning on your front foot and just a few centimeters will change the timbre of your voice. And everyone, please, if a mic moves while you're playing, maybe the mic stand didn't hold or it got bumped, please tell the engineer. Don't let it go, even if you're embarrassed because you're the one who bumped it. Um, we're much happier to to put it back in, in place and not find out at the end of the session that we were micing the, the floor or something that it, it moved out of, uh, out of access. Oftentimes we have so much that we have to, um, have to have to listen for, some things can slip by, so you can help us out with that. How to listen in the studio. Um, learn to listen to the global sound of the recording, not just your own instrument. Obviously, when you come into the control room, you listen back and um, you're, uh, you're influenced by your mood while you, were, while you were playing, okay? You're gonna remember all the mistakes you made. And so when you come in, oftentimes you may be discouraged and you may just, come in and focus on your own instrument. Um, I invite you to listen to everyone, not just to listen to the impact of everything, but note how your instrument works with the others, what role it occupies. Do I have my own space or am I conflicting with someone else's, either in terms of frequency or movement? I remember a, a wonderful seminar with a uh, great guitarist named Steve Kahn uh, a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. And he's a wonderful jazz guitar guitarist principally. And I, I, I like going to seminars of musicians and learning about other uh, instruments and what problems they have and what suggestions they make. 
And I, it was very interesting to me that he suggested to guitar players while they were playing depending on what's going on around them if the if the piano is playing a lot of the left hand a lot of the bass or there's a big dealing with a big electric bass or a big space sound to not play the last the lower two chords and to keep all the um, the chords in the on the on the higher on the higher end or anyway just to leave off those last two notes so those are the kind of things that you can analyze when you come and listen globally instead of just listening to yourself to yourself and see how you can fit in better. Um, I have um, just about just about through here. I have some random suggestions. Uh, the first is hang out with colleagues who make constructive criticism, even sometimes if it's brutal rather than those who tell you how great you are all the time, because that's what will make you grow. For drummers, take the snares off in song intros until you have to come in so it doesn't sit there and go the whole time. Uh, please learn to tune the drums. It's, uh, it's complicated, but it's a lifesaver and... Um, it's not a question of saving me, the engineer, time, but it means that I won't have to manipulate your drums to the point that you won't recognize them anymore. So if you give me a good tuned drum to start with, I can let the drums breathe and leave the microphones on all the time and let all of the sound um, come across instead of having to put gates on and EQ and and heavily treat it. And that comes from the, the beginning. How It comes from having the drums tuned. Change your heads a few days before you have to record so they have time to settle. Please bring your own snare and cymbals when you're using the house set, whether it's in the studio or live. Sound-wise, those are the elements that will distinguish your sound. Guitarists and bassists, good batteries for pedals. Pedals, backup batteries, good strings changed a few days before the recording or performance. Invest in good cables and that you can bring with you and get rid of hum and other noise in your guitars and pedals. Get rid of that. For upright bass, a good clip mic will save you from a horrible DI live sound. And if it's a if it's good enough, like a DPA 4099, for example, you can even use it for recording. Singers for live work, consider, consider investing in a microphone that you like for your voice. If you happen to love the Shure Beta 58, you'll find them pretty much everywhere you go. So you say, well, why do I need to invest aside from they're really cheap? But um but the reason you might want to invest and have your own is because if I tell you what's under that screen when we open them to clean them, you'll wish you'd been singing in your own microphone. So there's a whole world in there that you don't want to know about. If you're serious about your career and you've come across a mic that's worked for you, think about making the investment. It will help you get a recognizable vocal sound quicker and you'll be more at ease using it as you know how it responds to proximity, to distance. You'll be able to use it and not have to figure it out every time. A technical sheet for recording or concerts, try to give as much information as possible. If you're a drummer, how many toms in your drum set? So I can count the microphones that I have to set up for you. Are you bringing your own snare and cymbals? Guitarist basis, are you bringing your own amplifier or do you need one? Hopefully, the more information you provide, the less you'll have to wait around while we're getting what you need. Um, I suggest you don't bring your friends to the studio when you record. It's a very delicate moment and you need all your concentration. Uh, don't underestimate how nervous you might be before uh, the red light turns on. And if you 
if you have all your concentration and uh, uh, and don't have to worry about distractions, I think it's uh, I think you'll be better off. So, and let me talk about the the very last thing, um, which really nobody talks about, and that's money. Okay. Um, what I want to suggest to you is to speak about money before the gig, whether you have to play live or whether you're um, coming to play on somebody's record in the studio or you're hiring somebody. Come to an agreement on how much and when you'll be paid or have to pay. Um, this is true even and maybe especially when you work for friends. You can work for free, but it needs to be your decision. As far as how much to ask, that's a little more difficult. You can find out from your colleagues how much they get paid and use that as a reference point. The important thing is to get paid enough where you're satisfied and you don't feel taken advantage of because you'll otherwise you'll play with resentment and that's not good. So uh, we need you happy in the studio or wherever it is behind the microphone. Okay, so that's um, never lose sight of the music. That's my best advice. And uh, that's, um, I pretty much finished what I have to say. Any, any questions or comments? I'd love to hear from you. Don't be shy. One thing, uh, another thing that's, uh, or you can be shy anyway, but um, one thing that's uh, that's important when you, in a situation, in a situation like this, where they ask you if you have any questions and all of a sudden you can't remember anything, or you think, yeah, I have a question, but it seems really stupid. Nine times out of 10, if not 99 times out of 100, what you want to know most everybody else wants to know, or at least someone else wants to know. So if um, if you ask the question, you're doing yourself a favor, but probably you're doing someone else a favor too. So, um, so please, please step up if you feel like it. Let's see. Hi, Maud. I don't know if I can. Oh, Hi. there you are. Hi. Um, thank you for this uh, talk. Thank uh, you for coming. I wanted to know how is it possible to, because I'm a singer, and I've always uh, uh, struggled to remember the mics that I liked, because I, I went uh, I went to school and they made me try some, and at the time, I don't know, I forgot to write it down, and now I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm not in school anymore, so it's it, I don't have a lot of opportunities to um, test a lot of microphones. So right. I would like to invest, but I'm not sure how to do that. And every time I ask someone who is a bit savvy, they're like, oh, but don't worry about that. You can use your SM58. It will do just fine until you cross a better mic in a live gig and I'm just like yeah okay but what if there are no better mics you know like maybe I, I want to bring mine I don't right know. right yeah I can understand I can understand that it's kind of a question of when your um when you're when you do do a live gig and the times that another microphone comes by um Check out what it is. Look at look at what it is. Look at the brand name. Um, for singers, depending on how much you want to spend, no, the the Neumann um, eighty seven mic is really wonderful, and I I think it costs around five hundred euros. I believe hmm. the Audio Technica makes uh, makes very good products for the money. Okay. Okay, those Neumann is like the really the really top end, and Audio Technica, um, I think, as I said, they make uh, really good um, products for the money. As does Sennheiser. Their uh, Sennheiser is an old uh, company, very old company, like Neumann is, and um, you can go see 
what the microphone characteristics are. Uh, your mod, you're working mostly live. Is that what you're mostly interested? I would think. Yeah. Yeah. The you have to consider depending on if you uh, the kind of music that you sing. If you buy a condenser microphone, which the Neum the Neumann is a condenser microphone. Do you know the difference between a condenser and a dynamic microphone? Okay. Yeah. A dynamic microphone is you can sing really you can sing a lot closer to it. You can I, you don't want to, but you can drop it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And usually nothing will happen to it. Um and it's um you don't have is as it's not as it's not as sensitive to movement. You kind of have to be pretty close most of the time because if you get too far off mic, the sound just goes away. Where and and the and the voice quality is good, it's very present, but it's usually not there's not a lot of brightness, not a lot of air, and there's not a lot of low end. It's kind of middle. Everything's kind of there in the middle. So if you're doing if you're doing rock, it's a it's a good choice or if you sing um in a situation where there's a lot of instruments playing around you a lot of monitors going they'll um there will be less leakage into a dynamic microphone than there will be in a condenser microphone i'm more used to very small combos and i play a lot of jazz and okay then for you a condenser mic would be would be really nice because with the with um, a sound system that's not very loud and uh, the monitors are low and, and it, it will give you a lot more detail. Okay. So I would suggest, um, I would suggest you try a condenser microphone and it can be any of either, any of those brands. Um, but and would I, that work like with a, because my my amp is uh, Roland, AC okay, sixty, and uh, someone told me yeah, but it doesn't it make sense to invest in in a better mic with that kind of amp. No, I don't agree. I don't. I don't. I don't agree with that. I think that um, a better microphone. We're not talking about. You're not buying a eight thousand dollar microphone that. You should you'd be only used in the studio anyway. So uh, I don't think that kind of reasoning applies for what you're trying to do. I think that's just fine. And then you get a better microphone and then when when it will be the right moment, then maybe you'll get a, a better mixer, better amplifier. And um, I think that's a good step, good first step to make. All right. Okay. And what? For instance, what kind of a, um, how do you say that? Like uh, in the Audio Technica or Sennheiser? Sennheiser? Sennheiser. Which one which would model? You recommend. Um, unfortunately, Maud, uh, I you caught me off guard. I don't remember the model numbers. I can I can look some up for you, but I think if you go on their website and you look for voc live vocal mics, okay. you, you'll be able to see. There's not there aren't going to be a hundred of them. So uh, dynamics. No, I think you should or, look for condenser. Okay, condenser. Okay, sure. just remember it's going to be a little more sensitive to feedback and. And also entered and to to distance, but you'll be able to really color your voice with. And uh, it's, it's good because I I could also use it to record like uh, demos or stuff. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Cool. Angelo. So che vuoi fare un disco? I know you want to do a record, Angelo. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope it was uh, hope it was interesting, and I especially I hope it was useful. <laughs>